So we're in Exodus and we're in season two. We're in the wilderness. All right. We got out of Egypt and we're, we're going through the wilderness. And the wilderness is, uh, is an interesting place. It says they went not by the shortcut, the shortcut route. If you were to look at a map from Egypt up to what is modern day Israel, you would just kind of hug you would just hug the coast of the Mediterranean, but the Philistines were there, and so they would have not had the courage to handle the Philistines, and so they go on another route. It could have been a two-week journey, and as we're going to learn, it takes 40 years. 40 years. Anybody ever picked the wrong lane? <laughs> you know what I mean? You're like going on 275, and you're like, oh, this is, oh, this, it's this one. And you cut three people off politely. You get over here, and as soon as you get over there, what happens? Oh. So there was a short route, but they didn't take the short route. Now they're in the wilderness, and the wilderness is important. The wilderness is important in the story, and it's important in your life because the wilderness is where the real transformation happens in your life. The wilderness. We don't change much when everything's going good. Why would you? Everything's going good. I don't need to change. Everything's going good. I'm happy. The money's coming in. Huh? My social media accounts are rocking. Everything's going good. There's no need to change. But to change often requires some stark things. I was reading an author who did this journey. He followed the, the footsteps. And he said he had traveled a lot of places in the world, and the Middle East was the most severe. And of the Middle East, the Sinai uh, Peninsula was the harshest environment he'd ever encountered. It's just harsh. You just get there, and it's the wilderness. It's barren. There's nothing. It's dusty. It's rocky. Water is scarce. And to survive in this environment is going to take something. And here is my kind of belief about this. First, this is representative of both a season in your life and perhaps a season in mine where you have to go through things that are not pleasant. And as we talked about last week, you're going to pray for manna from heaven. You're going to pray for food and you're going to pray for water. You're going to pray for all the things that you need. And God's going to get you through. But I'll say this, barely. Anybody ever have a season like that where God got you through, but barely? I mean, you're here, so you got through. But we don't like barely. We like to get by with lots of bonus, lots of extra. But they got by, but there's just enough food for every day. Just enough. What does that do to the human psyche? Now, think about it. If God gets you by and you have this massive savings account, so if anything goes wrong or seven credit cards from your parents, you know what I'm talking about? I went to India the first time. I traveled over there as a kid, and you know, I didn't have any credit card, any extra. I was just, every day I would have to find somewhere to live, some place to stay. And it changes you. It does something to you. You have no backup plan. I'm reliant on whatever I run into this particular day. That type of dependence has an effect on you. So I think what happens is we go through seasons of life where we don't have all the extra. We don't have all the, the cushion, all the margin that we would like. And yet God gets us through. Yet God provides for us. Think of it also like this. You are Israel, right? This is your journey. And what happens, if you know the whole story, they go through the wilderness. And what happens in the wilderness they get almost to the promised land, we're going to read about, but they, they send spies in to say, is the land good? And everybody goes, oh, it's good. It's definitely good. They bring back the grapes. They're giant. The, the food is fabulous. And they said, but there's giants in the land. I don't know if we can take it. And so God sends them to wander for 40 years until everyone of that generation, what? Died. So in other words, this is what's key to this story. The people that left Egypt and started here, where we are in the wilderness, are not the people that enter the promised land. They all died. 
the version of you that's going to enter the promised life, the life that God has for you, is not the you that left Egypt. If you're old enough, you could raise your hand and say, there's already a different version of me emerging. Can anybody say that if you're old enough? If you're 16, no thanks. I mean, I mean I'm not talking about, you know, you know, but is anybody with me? There's a new, ver- you know, and if, you're, and if you're like 30, you're like, eh, maybe I'm. What? An old way of you, an old way of thinking and living and doing has to die completely. Paul said it this way, I am crucified with Christ and I no longer live. You got to chew on that one for a minute. I no longer live. What, does, what exactly does that mean? Paul would always talk about the old man and he wasn't talking about his dad. He was talking about the old version of himself. So in other words, the wilderness is, is really about killing off the old stuff in you. And the old stuff in you dies slowly, just fights and claws and holds on. Um, anybody here selfish? I don't know. I don't really want to answer that in public. <laughs> to some degree, right, every one of us is selfish. Now, you have to be a little bit thinking about yourself to survive in life and so there's a certain part of that, but there's a obviously selfishness where you think about yourself and you don't think about other people, or you think about yourself to the detriment of other people. It can be a real problem. And it's especially a problem if you don't realize it. <laughs> now, hands will go up everywhere. Anyone know someone like that? <laughs> Where their, their self, selfishness, the, the being so self-absorbed, it just affects everybody around them. And it's so obvious to everyone around them, but for some reason that it's not obvious to that person. That's this thing. It's the process of letting that version of you die. Do you remember what Jesus does before he launches his ministry? He goes into the wilderness. For how long? 40 days and what? 40 nights. It's time to purge some of this stuff out. And his was a test, and he comes through the test, and he comes out the other side. And what you do is the same thing. You go through these tests, and man, they're, they're difficult. Man, you just... Anybody here ever been really tired? I mean, you know what I'm talking about? Like you're just really tired and you, you, you start to make mistakes when you're tired. You make mistakes in your thinking. You make mistakes in your decisions. You, and these guys, what they do is they go through the wilderness and you're just exhausted. You just have, you have like nothing left to give. You have, and it's like stripping you down. Do you know one of the things that was practiced a lot in the earlier church for people was fasting? You know, like heard about it or whatever, but now it's mostly talked about in health circles like intermittent fasting. But it used to be talked about in, in the church circles a lot because what it does is it strips you down. We have a saying for it. I am hangry. Is this, is this a saying? Is this a very common saying? Who's ever used it? Who is currently? <laughs> and what it does, it strips you down, Right? It's a very real thing. It starts to strip you down. And now all of a sudden, all this stuff that's there, it just starts coming out. You go, well, it's actually medical, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to argue with you. But just stay here for a minute. This has been going on for thousands of years. It just starts to strip you down. And it's like, that's who you are. That's who you are. You can't hide. Start taking away your food. Start taking away your stuff. It's okay. By the way, you're not a bad person. It's just... You're hangry. But you start getting stripped away. You start to get exposed. What does the wilderness do? It exposes you. You'll never change if you aren't exposed. Never. That's why you have that one person you're talking about. You're all raising your hand for that one guy in the family that's so selfish. and He has to get exposed. Something has to awaken him or her or you 
so that that version can die off. They no sooner get their foot into the prom, or, or into the desert, and this, they start crying for water, and then they get attacked. I want to read about the attack. Exodus 17, verse 8, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow, I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites. This is the first time Joshua is mentioned. As Moses ordered, and Moses, Aaron and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held his hands up, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on this side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. The Amalekites are going to be a thorn in their side forever. I'm going to read about this. Most biblical scholars will say this represents some sort of old man, selfish nature, the flesh, this selfish drive, and it's, it's just this constant attack. And something has to defeat it. Something has to get rid of it. And so there's this battle going on down here, and there's Joshua and all these people fighting in the army, and everything's going on. And over here on a hill is Moses. And to simplify the story, when Moses has the staff of God held up like this, they're winning, they're prevailing, and when it falls, they're losing. What's the story? What's this about? To me, for all the battles that we face in life, most of us are focused on the wrong thing. We're focused on, because if, if there's a battle going on and Joshua starts losing, what do you do? You turn your attention to the battlefield, like uh, Joshua. You know, I think what we should do is we should sort of flank them and we, we maybe should get some people over here undercover. And we have all these little tactical ideas about how we could win. And that most of us get drawn right here immediately. Whatever battle you're facing in life, you get drawn right here. And you start talking about the email the guy sent you and what's wrong with this, this person and what this person said to this person. And it all gets nitty and natty and very small. Or as the Apostle Paul said, uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. This isn't the battle. If you had vision, you'd step back a little bit and you'd say, oh, what's going on over here? Over here? Wait a minute. When this is up, we're winning. And when this is down, we're losing. Can I just say something to you? One of the great problems that's happening in our world, and our world's trying to reduce everything to scientific materialism. Scientific materialism is the idea that the only things that matter or really are important are things that you can touch or smell. That's all that really matters. There is no spirit behind it all, a.k.a. there is no God. And so all of the solutions to every problem, everybody's talking, everybody's screaming on the battlefield. They're screaming at each other, go over here, go over here. You did it wrong. The reason that we're not doing it is this. And you just hear it constantly from the time you wake up, you hear people screaming and screaming, go over here. And there's bloodshed and, and hatred and anger and everybody's just diving into this. And they're missing it completely. Dare we say a lot of us have jumped in there. I was listening to a person that was very, very, very influential, very powerful person. Influenced a lot of people. Recently say, I did this every single day of my life. 
I rallied people. I yelled at people. I was a general. I marshaled people. I got them foaming and frothing and riled up about all these different things. And he goes, it wasn't until I stepped away from it that I realized how foolish it all was. How do you step away? You can't be over here. This isn't a battle about that. This is a battle about this. What is this? The best that we can tell is this is some posture of Moses in alignment with God, doing God's will, doing God's work, doing it God's way. You know what's funny? It never says Joshua got tired. It says Moses got tired. Joshua's doing this. What's harder? What's more taxing? What's more difficult? I'll submit to you that the spiritual battle is more difficult. It's easier to just whack somebody back with an email. It's easier to just come back with them and do this and jab back. It's harder. This is, this is strategic. This is tactical. This is game-changing stuff. This is behind the scenes. This is what a lot of people can't see. I mean, do your kids a favor. By the way, after this is, after this is over, Moses is told to write this down. Now, you would say, well, well, that's interesting, or it's not interesting, or whatever. People are always writing things down. No, no, this is when writing was invented. This is right about the time that writing was invented. This was right about the time that they said, you know what? This is something that we need to give to the next generation. God tells him, write this down. Can I say something to you? Write this down. Log this in. This is not where the battle's at. No matter how much we've been lured and drawn to think that it is. You remember when one of the things that Jesus was tempted? He goes and he's in the wilderness and he says, go up into the the, the pinnacle of the temple and throw yourself down and like show everybody what you can do. And they're always trying to draw Jesus into this. Jesus says, no. Do you remember when he was standing for Pontius Pilate and he wouldn't answer and Pilate is there and he's accusing him and, and man, I just keep trying to put myself in that position, you know, and like, Man, I got a couple of good lawyers on speed dial. Pilot, right? He won't answer. He won't answer. He won't answer. Pilot is exasperated because he's Pilot. Because Pilot lives in this world. And what he believes is, I'm powerful. And he finally says to Jesus, he says, don't you know who I am? I, can, I have the power of life and death over you. Jesus said, you wouldn't have any power if it weren't given to you from my Father in heaven. I've been on this mountain. I know where the real power lies. See, if you've been on this mountain, this doesn't scare you. This doesn't hyperventilate. You know, we got a lot of people hyperventilating, freaking out, panicking and slashing and running and... Jesus stands there before Pilate. He's pretty calm. If you don't catch anything in the story of Jesus with Pilate, you better catch it. He's calm. The power's over here. You're not in charge as much as you think you are. This is the battle. For the next generation... We gotta teach them where to look. That's what we have to teach them. Stop looking over here. Because here it gets real, they get really interested in it and like, oh, well, we're gonna we're gonna come around to this side, and they get all into it, and this is what everybody learns, and everybody's drawn into it. This is where all the noise is, all the clamor is. Somehow I see this as kind of quiet. Just a 
aligned with God. And the greatest thing you could teach your kids is just get aligned with God. The mountain was always the place where you came close to God. That was what it always was. You went in the mountain to be close to God. Always in the scripture like that, it was symbolized. This is, this is nearness to God. You say, Chris, but it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a cheap cop out sort of answer for all the complex problems in today's society. And I'm telling you, no, no, no. That's where we're all being fooled. We're all getting drawn into this. This is how we fix it. This is what we do. And we slash and we fight. And it's like, we need to come back to God. Everybody just needs to get back to the mountain. And get like this. What is this? Well, it's, it's, it's worship. It's surrender. It's God's my authority. I'm not my authority. I mean, you've got to pick an authority in your life. A lot of people make themselves the authority. That doesn't go well, but they'll try. But this is like God's my, God's my authority. Everything flows from there. And as we're going to see as we go further, they're, they're going to get these set of rules and commandments and all this stuff. But it all begins with this right here. This is victory in your life. I was thinking about when they were singing this song, all my life you have been faithful. Like, man, like, it touched me in a, in, a, in, a, in a deep way today. I was thinking about one of our beautiful family members right here. And I was, we were anointing these babies with oil. And I went to anoint his mother as we were saying goodbye for her last days on earth. All my life you've been faithful. All I want to ask you to do today, I really only have one thing I'm asking. Stop spending so much time here. Whatever that means for you. For some of you, it's social media. I don't know. I'm not trying to tell you what it is for you. You know. You, God probably already told you what it is. Some of you, it's jabbing back and forth with a neighbor. I don't know what it is. But just... This is not your battle. Are there idiots out there? Yes. Are you one of them? Perhaps. We're just different degrees. Let's spend our time here. You know? Let's get rightly aligned with God. What's the best thing? What's the best thing I can do for myself, for my family, for my community, for this church? Just, I can be on the mountain, hands up. All my life, you've been faithful, God. It's the best thing I can do. It's a good place to be. And then this stuff will start to take care of itself. Hmm? I would like to do this. If you guys can do that song again, maybe they'll do it again. Will you stand with me and uh, find some position right now that puts you and say, you know what, God, I want to be in alignment with you. I want to be under your authority, your leadership in my life. I want to be on the mountain where the battle is won. You guys sing.